Can you hear me well? Yes. Amen. Make us one. It's a beautiful song, beautiful message. When God blessed me to, he came and he introduced himself to me and he blessed me uh, with the opportunity to surrender my life to him. One of the first lessons that God taught me was that my life was no longer mine, that it was no longer about me. It was no longer about what I wanted, how I wanted it, when I wanted it. Before you meet God, pretty much life is about you, even in relationships, even in the things that you do, it's always about you getting the best place at work, the highest position, getting the best of anything. It's about you, how you dress. It's about how you live. But when you come to God, the very first thing He teaches you, or the very first thing He taught me, is that it's not about me anymore. I, yes, I was a chosen individual. Yes, uh, God has blessed me. But it's always been with one in ten purpose. I give you, go and give to others. And my life has never been the same, and it truly has been blessed. Because as Paul says, none of us live to ourselves, and none of us die to ourselves. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the time has come for your people to receive the bread of life. As you bring down manna to the nation of Israel when you were guiding them, their Lord, on their way to the promised land, we now, dear Lord, stand with our hands open, dear Lord, ready to receive the manna from heaven, dear Lord. I am but the instrument, dear Lord. I am but the voice that you have chosen today, dear Lord, to speak through, dear Lord. Glorify your name. Bless your people, dear Lord. And continue to guide us and strengthen us, dear Lord, until the day, dear Lord, when we see Jesus face to face. In his name we pray and thank you. Amen. 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 Jesus had a goal when he called 12 individuals, 12 different individuals, 12 different backgrounds, 12 different attitudes, 12 different ways of seeing things. And he called each one of them with a purpose. And the purpose was that they were to be the founders, the first preachers, so to speak, of his gospel, the first preachers of his church. But there was something about these 12 disciples that needed to be fixed. Again, 12 individuals who had to learn one thing. And let's go to the book of John, chapter 17, to see what Jesus' goal for these 12 individuals was. And not just for the 12 individuals, but for anyone and everyone who would come to them. John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Twelve individuals who had to learn how to be one. Twelve individuals who have to learn how to live for others rather than live for themselves. As we study the scriptures, we come to one strong conclusion. That God has never worked or has never assigned a man to do anything by himself. It was God who decided that it wasn't good for man to be alone. Now a lot of us who take that verse to mean that God is just talking about marriage. But God is talking about a whole lot more than just marriage. He's talking about an individual life. There are a lot of people who live separated from everything, separated from people, separated from who like to do their own thing. But when God said that it is not good for men to be alone, he meant that it's not good for man to be by themselves. God has always assigned us to be part of something, something bigger than us. Remember, it was God who assigned marriage. It was God who put two people together to become one flesh. It was God who put two, it was God who grabbed 12 individuals to work as one with one intent purpose. 
to be a benefit and a blessing. When God established his church, he never called one particular individual to be above others. See, the disciples had a problem. The disciples believed that each one of them should be the leader. That each one of them was more important than the other. And one day Jesus grabbed a little child and said, Listen guys, I know that all of you guys want to be the head honcho. James and John were so desirous of that position that they even grabbed their mother to try to work with that with her to try to get these positions from Jesus. But Jesus was saying, look guys, it's not about you. It's not about the position that you guys are looking for. And Jesus told them very clearly, listen, whoever wants to be the greatest among you, what did he tell them that they had to do? Serve. So what Jesus was saying is, is, look guys, if you guys want to be the best at anything, if you guys want to be number one in the kingdom, then learn to serve. It's not about being number one about what you accomplish. No, no. It's what you can help others accomplish. It's about what you can help someone else. Because we all read about the miracles that the disciples did. We read about how many churches Paul lifted up. But who was more blessed? Paul, who raised the churches, or those who listened to that message? They were both just as blessed. Because we, as we're studying this morning, the blessing is meant to be a group thing. Amen. Remember that before sin came in, Jesus told Adam and Eve, go and multiply, become fruitful. And this command was given to them before sin came about. So this earth was to be filled with lots and lots of people. It has always been God's desire to have a group thing. Remember there are 10,000 times 10,000 angels in heaven. It's not just one of them, one or two. And they all work for the same goal. See, the beginning of the in the beginning of church, for things to work out, the disciples had to learn exactly this how to live, and how to be one. And as you read about the beginning of church, if we go to um, Acts chapter 2, and verse 1, we see that the disciples began to understand how important this unity thing was. Notice that in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place. And then we read in verses 46 and 47 of the same chapter, So continually daily with one accord in the temple, temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity, praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. It began with 12. Then it went to 500 who saw Jesus were raised. Then it was 120 that were sitting at the at the at the main temple in the upper room, then 3,000. You notice how the numbers kept growing and growing and growing because it was always God's purpose that his people be united under one banner. Things never work out when there is division. If we go to Mark chapter 3, verse 25, and I'm going to ask someone from the congregation to read this for me. Mark chapter 3, Verse 25. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. What did Jesus say? That if a house is what? How strong is that house that's divided? It can't stand. Sooner or later, that house is going to crumble. And what is the problem? Why does this, why does this house crumble? Because it's divided. When two individuals are living under the same roof and they can't work together, divorce is automatic. When there are two individuals at work and they can't decide how to run the business, the business fails. See, in God, God, one thing that God understood is that unity, working together, working as a unit, is a blessing. Working divided, nothing works. As you notice, 
that it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three, who partook in the creation. We remember Jesus being our mediator, but in salvation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all play their part in the salvation of man. Amen. From the beginning, God taught us how important it was to work as a union. From the very beginning, this is God's character. This is the focus that we're trying to gain. This is what God wants us to be in his character. And his character has always been about working as a unit. Different powers, different styles, for one goal. One goal. When divided, things never work out. When 12 spies went to look at the promised land, 10 had one opinion, two had another opinion. Did the nation of Israel enter the promised land? No. There was division. And when there is division, nothing ever works out. So, how does the church become unified? Because throughout the whole scriptures we read and we continue to hear how strong and how important it is for us to be of one accord. We're living in what I consider the days in which we will soon see Jesus. I think, honestly, the way things are going, that we're getting closer and closer to our dream, closer and closer to our hope, which is in seeing Jesus very soon. But for that to happen, we have to be unified. For that to happen, the church has to be in unity. Because the thing about it is, is that I don't want to enter the kingdom of heaven without my blessing. If she's not going to be there, heaven is not going to be heaven to me. So I want everyone who is with God to be there. Because it's kind of lonely living in a community by yourself. It's kind of lonely not having people around you. It's lonely when you don't have people to talk to. It's lonely when you don't have a family. I've spoken with many uh, only child, and one of the things that the, the biggest desire, despite the fact that they get everything, despite the fact that they receive everything, one of the biggest desires for them is to have other brothers and sisters. Because it's a big difference when you grow up by yourself than when you grow up in a, fa in a large family. I was blessed to have three sisters and a brother. And there were times we were rough. I'm not going to sit up there that everything was rosy. Of course not. But it's a huge blessing. An incredible blessing to know that you have them. It's a huge blessing to have my nieces, my nephews, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law. Blessing. It's nice to know that I have, whenever I want to go, it's nice to know that I have different houses to visit. And to reminisce about those things. So, being unity and being in numbers is a blessing. But how does the church become unified? Why is it so important? And why does God desire for us to be as one? Well, there's one story that captures my attention, and when I first read it, I saw the beauty of what unity is. I saw what Jesus desired from his church. And if we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it's a story that a lot of us know. It's a story of when Jehoshaphat was going to be invaded and being attacked by the Moabites and the Ammonites. It's a story in which this happened after the kingdom of Jerusalem got divided. Remember, ten tribes went to one side, while there was two tribes that stayed on the other side. So this was a divided kingdom. And this is, this is a story that teaches us two things. One, what a divided kingdom can do. And two, what unity can accomplish. And there's several lessons that we are going to study this morning. Lesson number one, if we go to verse one of this. It happened after this that the people of Moab and the people of Ammon and the others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they that are Hosasar, Tamar, which is Engidei. The one thing that unifies a people, a church, is a situation in life. There's nothing that, um, that 
unifies two people, a mother and a father, than to know that their child is in danger. That to know that there's a problem. I've met a lot of individuals in my lifetime who have had to deal with their children who have been addicted to drugs, or their children who have run away, or their children who somehow, some way, got into the wrong, into the law. The unfortunate part is that I put my parents through this also. But nothing unified them more than having that love for that child and wanting to see that child get out of the situation. Nothing unified more these parents than to know that there was someone in, in danger and their love for them wanting to see them get out of it. When I first preached here, my first time here back in April, I talked about the battle of David and Goliath. And I talked about how we are in war. Reality of it is, my brothers and sisters, it hasn't changed. This, in past after school, we were studying that also, and again it was mentioned that we're at war. It hasn't changed. The reason that we're preparing for Jesus, the reason that we're preparing for all of this is because we are at war. See, in this world, we have an enemy. And he's an enemy that's looking for destroy, to destroy. No sooner had these two kingdoms separated than what happened. All of a sudden, one of them, the smallest one, was going to be invaded. See, the, the, the devil doesn't wait too long to take advantage of the division. The devil doesn't wait too long to step in. When he sees that there's a problem, if he's caused a problem, and he sees that the two people, two people are beginning to separate, the devil goes in there for the kill. The devil goes in there to destroy. Again, the devil is not looking just for two people to end up in divorce. He's looking for the whole family to be destroyed. He's looking to destroy the children if there are children involved, to destroy property, to destroy whatever he, he can, because the devil's about complete and utter destruction. And here, the nation here, Jerusalem finds himself in a battle. Nothing unifies people more than to know that they're in a battle. And you see, the church one day, we're pretty calm right now because things have not reached the boiling point. But it soon will come and be clear that we're going to have to unify. It will soon become very clear that God's people are going to have to let go of everything else that is around them and get together to battle and to end this war. It will soon become very clear that the devil is seeking to destroy and the devil is going to put forth plans that are going to force many of God's people to recognize we're in a battle and that we need to unify. We need to get together. Because it's important to understand that we're all in the same cause. We may be from different backgrounds, we may be from different uh, cultures, but it's the same battle. We all face the same enemy. And the devil doesn't change his strategy because you're Filipino or because you're Puerto Rican. The devil has one focus, destruction. Lose your eternal life. Lose your salvation. That's the only focus that he has. And it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you've been. That's his focal point. And we all need to unify and we all need to recognize this battle. We all need to recognize the schemes of the devil. And you need to unify and recognize that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a Filipino church, it's not a Puerto Rican church, it's not a Cuban church. It's a whole congregation worldwide under the same banner of the cross. Amen. We're all together in this. We're all unified. So when the devil is attacking one, he's attacking everyone. And we need to unify be united under that battle of Christ. In verse 3, the second point, verse 3, very interesting how Jehoshaphat, now Jehoshaphat is finding himself against these great armies. Now, the normal thinking of a king, or the normal thinking of any leader, is to what? Get your armies. That's the normal thing. Let's get the battle, let's get ready, let's get ready to fight. But how does Jehoshaphat face the fact that he's about to, uh, to go to war? Verse 3. Chapter 20, Chronicles, 
2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. And it says, And Jehoshaphat feared, and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. We're all under the same battle. But God has never asked us, and this is important, last time, the first time I was here, we all need to recognize and we all need to make a choice to fight. But God never said that the fight was mine or God. God never set me forth to fight it. See, God made me part of a church, of a particular group. He has never sent forth anyone to fight on their own. And Jehoshaphat recognized that if he was to be victorious in this, it wasn't just about him. See, Jehoshaphat quickly proclaimed a fast, calling everyone to get involved. Amen. It wasn't just Jehoshaphat. See, it's not just the pastor, it's not just the elder, it's not just the board, it's not just the leaders, the directors of the church. For a church to function, for a church to be victorious, everyone must get involved. Amen. Everyone must accept the call. Everyone must need to understand the battle. Everyone must recognize that we're in this together. See, that's what Paul said, that no one lives to himself and no one dies to himself. Because you see, when God formed the church, it was for the intent purpose that everyone worked as one. For everyone to battle. For everyone to pray. See, when I was part of a blessed experience in the Orlando Filipino Church, and this is where the power of everyone getting involved becomes a blessing. Uh, we had a couple of our members in the Philippines doing a, a a mission over there, doing an evangelistic series. You guys may know them, Betsy Pagone. And they were up there and we received a test that the rebels were pursuing them, that the rebels were checking in on them. They had gone somewhere to get a uh, to get a massage after a long day of doing a lot of work there, a lot of mission work there. And a couple of individuals walked into where they were and they told them, listen, we got the car out there to take them home. And when Gans heard about this, God was like, well, wait a minute, we never called anyone to come pick us up. So they were being set up. Hopefully they were looking, what they were looking for was to try to kidnap. We got a text here in Orlando that they were in trouble. Quickly a message went out to all the prayer warriors in our church. About 16 to 20 of us showed up at church, not because, not on a Wednesday night, not during a Monday night group, not during a prayer group, just because these two individuals were in danger. We spent the next hour plus praying for them. And before we finished praying, the pastor received a message that they were saved. That's the power of prayer. And it wasn't just the pastor who stayed at home praying. No, it was called team meeting, prayer wars, show up to church. And we all showed up. We all prayed. Because we're all in this together. When something happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. If there is a home that is suffering, all of us should be suffering. It's not just about the pastor or the elders to go visit. It's about all of us caring enough for each other to go visit each other. It's about us taking the time to focus on each other because we're all in this battle. Your home may be perfect now and theirs may be suffering, but one day your home may be suffering and you may need that help. And that's why Jesus said, treat as you wish to be treated. Do for one another. That's the golden rule. Love one another. Treat each other. Do for each other. And we were blessed to receive that message. And we went home blessed, happy as can be, knowing that our brethren were saved. They completed their mission, they came back, they with us again, and it was a blessed mission. Amen. But that's the power of prayer. It's about a church working together. They were way up in the Philippines. We were down here in Orlando. But God does not look at distance. God listens to prayers, God answers the prayers, and it doesn't matter where his people are, whether it be in the Philippines or here in Florida, God is protecting both groups. 
He's listening to one group and protecting the other group because it's a unit. It's a unit thing. It's a one thing. So Jehoshaphat recognized very clearly, I'm going to need help. But he didn't just call his people. No. He also got God involved. Because he recognized, yes, I got my people, I got the church. But if I'm going to be victorious against an enemy who wants to destroy me, I have to have to unite myself with the individual who has defeated me. See, the devil tried this in heaven. He tried to divide. And the unfortunate part is that he did grab a third of those angels and he did divide the kingdom of heaven. But his victory was not complete. They were cast out. It was set forth. So Jesus united with the rest of his angels. Now notice, Jesus would have thought could have destroyed Lucifer and his demons. And the reality of it is, is that Jesus did not need his angels to fight Lucifer and his demons. He created them. He could have fought them by himself. But when he went to fight, his angels were with him. Proving once again, this is a united Thing. This is not an individual thing. This is about a group focusing on the same goal. See, heaven was just as much the angels as it was God's. That was their home. They wanted to protect it also. So they united with Jesus in that battle. And they were victorious. Because this is a unit thing. This is our church. This is not just God who founded it. He made us all part of a very special group. And all of us should be fighting for this church. All of us should be praying for this mission. Amen. Verse number four. And here's the very important part that is part for all of us to play. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. From how many cities? All the cities. All the cities. Now notice very clearly that everyone responded to this. See, everyone recognized the battle wasn't just Jehoshaphat, and they recognized that it's not just Jehoshaphat who has to protect us. When I was first here, when we talked about David fighting against Goliath, I explained that when we fight, it's not when David was fighting against Goliath, he wasn't just fighting an individual. Remember that the plan from Goliath was that if we beat, if I beat this individual, then all of the soldiers become our slaves. But it wasn't just the soldiers. That included their wives, their children, their parents. So basically, anyone in Israel would have become the Philistines' slaves. So they recognized, they recognized, David wasn't just a one-on-one -on -one battle. He wasn't just fighting for himself. He wasn't just fighting for the glory of God. He was fighting for the nation of Israel. See, when we battle, is when we battle the devil, it's not just about us. It's about our husbands. It's about our wives. It's about our children. It's about our church. It's about man, the doctrines that we believe in. It's about something that is very special. And again, it's not the pastor, the religious leaders, the groups, the evangelists that have to do this. It's us. Because these are our homes that he wants to destroy. This is our church. This is one church that is part of a general conference. But it's not for the general conference to come here and to make this church what it should be. It's about the members being here making this church what it should be. Amen. The general conference has their mission. But we as individuals have it also. It's up to us to protect our church. It's up to us to protect our homes. So the individuals in these cities recognize, I've got to stand up. I've got to fight. Because it's not just the palace that's in danger. It's my little one-bedroom home that's in danger. It's my wife that's in danger. It's my children that's in danger. So they all responded to the call. They all recognized that all of the Israel belong to them. These cities belong to them. They were living. These vineyards, they were the ones who were planting them. So they belong to them. It wasn't just the king. So all of them responded. And it's up to us to recognize that this is our church. This is our property. This is our home. So it's important for us to unify that whenever a battle cry is called for, that all of us unite in that prayer. That all of us unite to fight 
for what God has blessed us with. Verse 13. And this is pretty important. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Now notice my brothers and sisters that it wasn't just the men who showed up. Wives showed up. Children showed up. Everybody was there. See, the interesting as I was studying 2 Chronicles, it's pretty interesting who the Moabites and the Ammonites were. If we go to Genesis chapter 19, and you read verses 33 to 38, you get the history of who the Ammonites and the Moabites were. It's a pretty sad story. Interestingly enough, these two nations were born from a righteous man. They were born from a righteous man named Lot, who unfortunately made a bad decision to move into Sodom and Gomorrah, thinking that he was going to benefit his family by them receiving riches and them receiving a lot of the benefits and wealth that came with Sodom and Gomorrah. But unfortunately, though he may have become a rich man, he lost his family there. Two of his daughters, when they went, when, when Lot went in to tell his daughters and, her, and his sons-in-law that Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be destroyed, they looked at him as like he was a crazy man, like they didn't even know who their dad was. They mocked him. Then his wife and two other daughters actually made it out. The unfortunate part is that the wife was so connected with Sodom and Gomorrah that she stopped to turn around and see what she was losing. She became a pillar of salt. Now the other two daughters, unfortunately, had a wrong concept on how to think. And they actually got their father drunk. Both of them had relationships with them. And out of those relationships, the Moabites and the Ammonites came into existence. I want to stop here in this and explain something that I feel really deep and strong about. Unity and the progress of the church begins at home. Sometimes, you know, we, we talk about how the youth and the children are the future. I don't agree with that. The reality of it is that the children and the youth are our presence. They are just as important today as they move into tomorrow. And what we do with them, or don't do with them, will determine what kind of future our church will have. If we teach them to be God-fearing individuals, if we teach them unity at home, how to honor, respect, and have great respect and great honor for God and His church, then we got a credible future ahead of us. But if we're not teaching them that, future gets clear. Remember Eli, he never taught his children how to respect and honor God. It turned out pretty bad for them and for the nation of Israel. They got destroyed by the Philistines. The temple got taken away. And who, were leading, who was leading the march? Remember it was both Eli's sons that were carrying the ark. See, what we do or don't do in our homes plays an incredible part of what happens in our church. And I believe that if we keep thinking that these kids, we only have to prepare them when they become a certain age, we're losing out on an incredible blessing. It's important to teach our children today the respect and honor of God and His church. Because they're not our future leaders. They're our present leaders. They play as much of an important role in church today as we do. They, you'd be amazed as to how the talent that we have in Orlando Filipino Church always amazes me. That's one of the things that I love about that church, is seeing how many of these youngsters, how many of the youth partake. We have so many singers, so many individuals, man, who are not afraid. Every Sabbath, there's a diff different youth that is reading the scriptures. And some of them read them from memory which some adults can't even do, but some of them read them from memory. And I see them in the way a lot of these youth partake. I saw how they partook in the VBS that we had this past summer. And it's incredible. It's a blessing. Unity begins at home because we have two different families here. We have the Ammonites and the Moabites who weren't trained well, and yet now we have these children, wives, all partaking 
all getting together to fast and to pray. You notice the difference? Two different groups. But it all determines on where we go. One of the things that I've learned is that when you become God as part's family, everyone becomes your family. It's up to you. I worked in Boston as the elder for the youth there. Probably one of my best years there. I enjoyed it, watching these youth. I'm not saying that all these youths were perfect at everything, but there's a lot of potential there. There's a lot of blessings there. And I recognize and realize that part of my job was not just to sit there when there was a meeting. Part of my job was to train, to teach, to guide them. Sometimes we think that we're talking to the youth, we're talking to children, and they're not paying attention. You'd be amazed as to what these children gather. You'd be amazed as to what these children listen to. And even more importantly, you'd be amazed as to what some of these children will grow up to be. This is God's church. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. So God doesn't look at difference. He doesn't say when you turn 18, now the law becomes important to you. No. So God, he took the little child and he said to the disciples, you have to be like this individual if you're going to be a ruler of my church. So God doesn't look at children as future. He looks at them as someone who's important to his church today. So train your children. Bless your children. Pray over your children. Fast over your children. Because they play just as much an important role in the church today as any of us do. Amen. Verse 15 to 17. And he said, Listen, all of you, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down up against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Uriel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. One of the things that I've learned throughout just my study in the scriptures and in the things that I've taken, God loves to work with a united people. Amen. When God sees his people together, God loves to work. Jesus promised that where there are two or three in my name, I will be there also. Jesus loves when his children get together. When his children men seek him, when his, when his children see that there is a battle, when his children see the need to be as one, God is right there. God's prayer, Jesus' prayer about unity is fulfilled anytime we do that. Anytime we, we are seeking, anytime we get together for whatever, God's there. I believe God is in every small group that we get united to be in. I don't know if we have the small groups here. I pray that we do. But we have small groups Mondays, Tuesdays, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, and Fridays in Orlando. Plus we have our midweek prayer. And God loves to be with us in our world. All those lessons and all those studies are blessed because God loves unity. When his people gather together, God makes it a purpose to be with his people. And the blessing here, man, is that this morning through Sabbath school, we were talking about how John Mark, unfortunately, left the service of Paul and Silas at the beginning of this because he got a little discouraged over what he saw. He got a little discouraged and decided, well, maybe this isn't for me, and he left. But God here gives us a message. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed at what you think you're seeing. Stay together. Work as a unit. Victory is assured. Amen. Because see what it is that the devil wants to divide us and wants to make us seem as if we're not going to accomplish. See, one of my biggest hopes and one of my, the greatest reasons that I continue to walk and continue to be with the Lord and continue to believe in this church is not because of what I see. It's because God promised that this church would be victorious. It's because God promised that this unity, this oneness will happen. It's because God promised that at the end of all of this, 
victory is assured. See, we are not on the wrong side. We are not. It doesn't matter what the devil wants to display. It doesn't matter what the devil is out there showing. It doesn't matter if you see in church that people aren't showing up. Keep showing up. Because eventually they'll show up too. It doesn't matter if you don't see people praying. Keep praying. Because those people eventually will stop praying also. It doesn't matter if people aren't tithing and offering. Keep tithing. Keep offering. They'll come around also. They will give their tithes and the offering. See, God has never given up on this church, and we should never give up on this church. God has always been with us. Even in the bad times when the nation of Israel was just going in 20 different directions, God never, never walked away from them. Even when they were under Babylon, even when they were all under captivity, even when they stoned Stephen, there were still many of the church were Jews. God doesn't give up on his people. And victory is assured to us. In Revelation, we read that as long as we continue to endure, victory is assured. It's there. See, these individuals have not gone out to battle. These individuals did not put on a sword. These individuals went to the Lord, and the Lord explained to them very clearly, the victory is won. It's done. You don't have to fight. It's over. They may have threatened and they may still be out there with swords. They may still be out there with armies. But rest assured, the victory is yours. It's done. Second Chronicles 7, 14. And someone can read that for me. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. My people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Amen. 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 We can be as sinful, we can be as downtrodden, we can be as separate as one. But the moment, you know, notice he didn't say if one. He said, if my people. So who was he including in this? Everybody. Everyone. If my people will look to me, they will humble themselves, they will recognize me, I will forgive, I will heal, I will strengthen, and victory will be assured. That's God's promise. And this is exactly what he was fulfilling to the nation of Israel, to Jerusalem and Judah at this very moment. He says, look, guys, don't worry about it. The victory is assured. It's yours. It's yours. You did the one thing that you needed to do. You got together as a people. You prayed. You sought me. And this is what the church, what God is calling us to do. See, we're not going to win this victory by picking up swords. David did not beat Goliath by his strength. David and Goliath never tangled. David threw one rock and Goliath ended. But who has the power to take and give life? Okay, so why did Goliath fall? Because of David or because of God? Because of God. This is our victory, guys. This is God telling us that it doesn't matter what the devil is doing, the victory is assured. Stick together. Stay as one. Stay on the path that I've chosen for you. The name, the, the the first church went through a lot of things. They were persecuted. They were tortured. James died. Peter died. Paul died. It seemed like the whole church was just going down. But every time one of them died, a hundred took their place. During the dark ages, the same thing. It seemed like the devil was just doing away with the church. Fifty million people died in 1260 years. Yet here we are today. Why? Because God has promised a victory. Because God has assured His people, His church, stick with you, stick with each other, the victory is yours. And as long as we keep that focus, as long as we remain united in that victory, united in that promise, this church will continue to be victorious. Amen. Amen. Verse 18, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Notice something interesting. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head, with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. 
Worship is about unity. Notice that it wasn't Jehoshaphat who worshiped the Lord on his own. Jehoshaphat didn't separate and go to a different room to thank God for what was happening. They all got together and worshiped God for the blessing. See, this is the blessing of the Sabbath. It's the blessing where everyone gets together with one and ten purpose. It's not that we stop working. It's not that we're just here to ask God to give us the blessing. No, it's for us to take the time to thank God that the church has survived another week. That the church has survived another day. To worship God because His victory continues. It hasn't ended. Despite the fact that everything this church has gone through, it still stands. Why? Because God has assured them the victory. Because God continues to be with His church. Unifies worship, unifies us. Getting together and recognizing what God has done for all of us. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one who ate this week. How many of you guys went hungry this week? How many of you guys were able to go to work this week? How many of you guys have money in your account? You notice I wasn't the only one who got blessed this week. The whole church got blessed. In separate areas, different ways, different areas, but all of us got blessed. Because God takes care of His whole church, not just one. It's all of us. And worship, we come out here to worship not just for what we receive, but I'm thankful that my family gets blessed. Sometimes we, we, we think that it's all about us, but like I said, no one lives to himself and no one dies to himself. And sometimes we tithe and we offer and we bring forth because we think we want to get these blessings. But to me, there is no greater blessing. My family are not Adventists. None of them are. I'm the only one. And I tithe and I offer and I give what I give. And they live better than I do. They have houses, better cars, some of them have better careers. But I'm not bitter about that. I thank God for that. Because I know that it's through the tithes and offerings that I'm giving, God is blessing me, not just by giving me all money and giving me, He's blessing me by knowing that my family is well and safe. He's blessing me in knowing that my family has a home, that none of them are going through any hardship. And to me, that's a great blessing. To know that my family is being blessed. To know that I have loved ones who God is taking care of. That's a blessing to me. It's not about what we have. It's not about, it's about what everyone else has. It's a blessing to know. Every time I go, we have potlucks. That's one of my favorite things there in Orlando, Filipino. Everyone told me all about the potlucks when I first got there. Right? Because that's what they're famous for. What you guys are famous for, potlucks. And I love them. And every time I partake in that's God's way of saying that, listen, I blessed your church, I blessed your people. Because I'm partaking with everyone there. We're all eating the same food. And those are blessings that God has given His church. Those are blessings. Every time we have AC, every time we have light, that's God blessing His church. And that's all of us giving and all of us being blessed. Because God blesses His church entirely as a union. Unity brings true worship, and that's why we come to worship. Let's go to the book of Acts. Chapter 2. Look at the book of Acts, chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 42 to 45. And notice something about the first early church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their position and goods and divided them among all, as everyone had a need. They all got together, did their homes, they ate, all of them had, they sold, and what they had and what they sold became everybody. Everyone got the blessing. Everyone worshiped. Everyone rejoiced. And everyone was being blessed. Unity and worship, it's a blessing. It's to recognize, when we worship, it's to recognize how God is taking care of His people, how God is taking care of His church. And when we are united in the same closet, when we are united, or when we see these things, it brings an incredible worship for us. Jehoshaphat saw the victory of God, but he saw that it wasn't just for him, it was for the whole nation. And because of that victory, he worshiped, and everyone who saw the victory worshiped also. See, God is about unifying. He did not worship together. 
when we start thinking outside the box and we start thinking outside of ourselves and we start worshiping not because I received but because someone else received worship becomes stronger the church becomes stronger it becomes more united when we start recognizing the victory that God gives us as a whole going back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20 2 Chronicles chapter 20 See, unity has its benefits. And if we read verses 24 and 25, we see that these individuals who united in prayer, united in fasting, united as a city, united as a kingdom, and got blessed as a unit. Verse 24 and 25. So when Judah, who? It's talking about all the cities. Remember all the cities went there? So when Judah came to a place where we'll look in the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were dead bodies falling on the earth. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, who? Jehoshaphat and who? His people. His people. They were all there. They found among them an abundance of valuables on dead bodies and precious jewelry which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And there were three days gathering the spoil because there were so much. They fasted as a group. They prayed as a group. They got together as a group. And when the blessings came forth, everyone got blessed. Amen. Not just one group. Not just one person. Not just the king. Everyone partook of the spoils. See, heaven is about all of us. Like I said, if my blessings are going to be there, not something to really desire. But if she's going to be there, if my family's going to be there, heaven is something that I can look forward to. See, we love our families and we love our friends and we love our co-workers and we love these individuals. We all have these individuals that we're close to. Heaven should be something that we desire for everyone. The blessings should be something that we desire for everyone. Heaven is huge. If we look and we see and we read what the New Jerusalem, how it's 375 miles across on all four, we see, man, that Jesus built this city with the intent of having many, many, many people. When we read the ark and how big it is, 450 feet long, 75 feet high, 50 feet wide, that's a big ark. When God does things, it's with the intent of having many. It's with the intent to bless many. And it should be our desire to see the whole church there. We should work together. We should pray together with the intent purpose of not just us reaching heaven, but having every one of us here reach heaven. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Someone can read that for me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Because to him it wasn't just the salvation he was receiving. To him it was a joy to know that the individuals that he worked with were going to receive that same salvation. See, for the disciples it wasn't just about them. Many of them sacrificed. And, and sometimes we look at the things that God may ask us to do, the things that God may ask us to sacrifice. But I've learned that if it's going to get one individual in heaven, it's worth me walking 20 miles. If it's going to get someone into the kingdom of heaven, 
It's worth me losing sleep and going over there to give me the Bible study. Because anything that we do, and it's going to be someone else, it's worth it. Jesus taught us that. He sacrificed everything he had, and he became a servant. Died on the cross, gave up his own life, and all because when he saw the travail of his suffering, he was going to be satisfied knowing that all of us were going to reach the kingdom of heaven. See, salvation is about all of us. It's about a union. It's about all of us reaching the kingdom of heaven. And for it, there are times that we have to sacrifice. But we have to stop, not look at what we think we're losing, but we have to focus on what they, the individuals that we're doing this, are going to gain. Paul lost everything. He considered it dumb. He found the one thing that was important to him, which was Jesus. And he did not stop sharing Jesus until he passed away. And even the very individuals who were going to execute him, I'm sure we see a Bible study from Paul. Because until his dying breath, it was his focus, not just to get into the kingdom of heaven, but to get as many other individuals in the kingdom of heaven with him. It has its rewards. And like Paul says, man, we cannot fathom the things that God is preparing for us. But they're worthy. They're worthy of us sacrificing. They're worthy of us working for them. And verse 29, verse 30, unity also brings something very special. Verse 29, 32 Chronicles 20. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all the time. Unity brings peace. At the end of all of this, once we recognize and we work together as a unit and the work is accomplished, we get an eternity of peace. We get an eternity of blessing. And even when we struggle here, even when we're going through our afflictions here, the disciples at one point got arrested, got let go from jail, and when they got together, they didn't complain. They prayed to God, they sang songs to God, prayed that God would make them more bold, and God blessed them with the Holy Spirit to continue on with the battle. God wants us to keep united. God wants us to look at the fact that this is a winning victory. But this is not about ourselves. It's not about an individual. Like Paul said, we all live for someone else and we all die for someone else. No greater love as this than a man should give up his life for his friends. It's what God taught us. And it's his whole purpose of this church. To work as a unit for the same focus and the same goal. My prayer is not only for the Clearwater Filipino Church, but for all the churches worldwide. For all of us to recognize God's main goal and for all of us to focus on that one goal and work together as a unit to finish this work and to spend eternity together rejoicing in his blessings. May God bless you. Amen. Amen.